to quantum oscillators. And um, well, I'll let you read their paper on your own, but long story short, um, if you look at the generator of the quantum uh, process, you can diagonalize it and you find the eigenvalue spectrum has a leading slowest decaying pair of eigenvalues with a complex conjugate pair. Um, and that corresponds to the slowly decaying oscillating mode that reflects the underlying oscillation. Um, we will use a similar framework for uh, not quantum, but just stochastic systems for the rest of the talk. But let me point out, just for the deterministic case, which is not the one that they talk about, but um, it sort of fits together, if I've got the asymptotic phase function theta of x, and I take e to the minus i theta, now I've constructed a complex valued function, which is an eigenfunction of the Kuban operator. Because if I ask for how does that function change in time, which is what the Kuban operator gives me for the deterministic system, I just can use the chain rule and I see it evolves as uh, i times negative 2 pi over t. So the eigenvalue is the uh, frequency times i. And uh, the same situation will unfold um, for the stochastic case. Boy, is it eerie not having any questions. Um, all right, so let me proceed. So each of these two different methods for defining isochrons that go back to Guggenheimer um, generalize in different ways for stochastic systems. Um, I'm going to just look at Langevin equations today because it's a bit simpler to describe, but some of the methods that I talk about also apply to things like jump Markov processes um, that are more general. But so let's suppose we've got an Ito stochastic differential equation. So now I've introduced noise with noise coefficients in this matrix uh, G. So I've got maybe K independent uh, noise processes forcing this. And um, uh, Yusuf Schwab et al. and Arkady Pekovsky a few years ago proposed to generalize the notion of phase to uh, from looking for a system of isochrons that have exactly the same return time to a system that has a mean return time that's uniform. And you can see an example from their paper here. If I take this um, red curve and I take different points starting on that red Poincaré section, then the time it takes to come around once and hit it again on average depends on the radius, right? It's not, the return time is not uniform. But if I take the green curve, then the return time is approximately uniform. They have a numerical procedure for finding such um, mean return time isochrons. And in a paper that, um, that my student Alex Keo uh, and Benjamin Linder and I wrote that appeared earlier this spring in SIM Applied Math, we took that idea and we showed that you can formalize it um, by setting up a partial differential equation with special boundary conditions that give you a function t, a timing function, which is uh, which has level curves that give you those mean return time isochrons. So here's just a sketch. You have to we would use a change of coordinates to unwrap the domain, and then we we have multiple copies of the domain, and we're asking for the first passage time from a point uh, at, at one contour to the point one rotation later. Now the operator here that shows up in this equation is the generalization of the Kuban operator to the stochastic setting. So you have this um, transport part, but you also have the, the diffusion part or the, the noise part. So this operator, L, I call it L dagger. I, we also call it the backward operator. Probabilists call it the generator of the Markov process. Um, you can think of it as the Kuban operator for a stochastic process. These are all names for the same thing. It's also the operator that shows up in Ito's formula, in Ito calculus. So just as an example of, of this framework in action, um, uh, before I go back to the main story, this is a heteroclinic oscillator. Um, if I take turn the noise off by saying the diffusion constant d to zero, then I have this vector field on the left where I spiral outwards from an unstable fixed point and I wind around taking longer and longer to get past these corners. There's an unstable uh, saddle point at each, cor each of the four corners and there's no finite period underlying limit cycle. But if I add noise, then I have finite mean return time 
And uh, we used um, uh, this framework introduced by Schwab and Alpikowski to define isochrons for that system. So here you see the timing function surface. Here's the level curves of the isochron function uh, scaled to run from zero to two pi. And if I take a contour of that isochron, uh, one of those isochrons, and I look at the mean time it takes for trajectory to return to the isochron after going around once, I see a, the uniform return time property. Whereas if I just take an arbitrary cut like a spoke of a wheel, then I have a non-uniform return time. And so this shows that the solutions of the partial differential equation we formulated do indeed have the properties of the mean return time that uh, Schwab et al. and Pukowski proposed as, as a way of uh, introducing the phase for a stochastic system. Okay, so that's one of the two generalizations of um, the original uh, uh, Durkheimer phase. The second one, um, which is the one I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk, is generalizing the asymptotic phase. So what's happening here is we take the density, and the density evolves forwards in time. So this is the density of trajectories at a location uh, y. Uh, now I have a typo. That should be y and y plus dy, not x. The density evolves according to the Fulker-Planck equation, or the Kolmogorov forward equation where you've got this same part that looks like the Liouville equation, and you have the diffusion part that comes from the noise effect. You can also ask how an observable evolves, and the evolution of the observable, the on average, is given by the generator of the Markov process, or this, this thing that I said is like the Koopman operator, plus a fluctuating uh, noisy term. If we ask for the average of the future value of the operator, then because the the Wiener process here, the white noise process has mean zero. This part of the formula drops out when I look at the average evolution, and I'm just left with the uh, L dagger. So these two operators, L and L dagger, in the stochastic setting are still adjoint to each other in the appropriate uh, inner product space. Okay, so uh, Benjamin Linder and I introduced um, the complex, uh, sorry, the stochastic asymptotic phase. Uh, based on diagonalizing these operators, L and L dagger, um, in an eigenfunction expansion. So we, to get this framework to work, we have to assume that um, there is a well-defined um, biorthogonal expansion. Um, so we have uh, eigenfunctions of the forward operator, like the Fulker-Planck operator, which I call P, and then eigenfunctions of the backwards operator or the generator, which I'm calling Q. And uh, they're orthogonal to each other if they have different uh, eigenvalues. Um, we're assuming that there's a single stationary distribution. That's, that would be P0. And all the other eigenvalues should have negative real parts. And then if the system is acting like an oscillator, then that means that the slowest decaying complex, uh, slowest decaying eigenvalue should be part of a complex conjugate pair. Um, it should be oscillating faster than it's decaying. And all the other modes should decay sufficiently fast that you can neglect them if, uh, if you look at long times. So we, we want all the other eigenvalues to have real parts that are more negative than the real part of the slowest decaying eigenvalue. So under those circumstances, um, we define the asymptotic phase for the stochastic system to be this function psi of x, which is the complex argument of the eigenfunction of the slow that comes with the slowest decaying eigenvalue. Um, so this is the idea that Cato and Akao have extended to, to what they call quantum oscillators, which is fascinating. Um, and it's also been used, a similar construction was used by Peter Wallenez and David Parian um, for looking at dephasing of genetic oscillators. Okay, so there's some utility to this expression. Um, just as an uh, example, um, so here's a noisy oscillator that comes from a neural model. Here's the eigenvalue spectrum of the, uh, the backwards operator. You see there's a complex conjugate pair as the leading eigenvalues. You can pull out the, um, the isochrons. And uh, in blue here, we have the deterministic isochrons. In black and red, we have the isochrons from our asymptotic phase analysis um, for two different levels of noise. And so they, they behave similarly, but they're they're different in subtle ways. Okay, so that's 
uh, enough background for me to now introduce the problem that we've looked at more recently, which is what happens if you have a spiral sink? So a spiral sink just means um, a linear, purely linear system with complex conjugate eigenvalues with negative real part. So and here's a specific example. So of course, trajectories are gonna spiral around and without any noise, they eventually converge to zero. So you obviously can't define the asymptotic phase function by looking at different initial conditions that converge to each other because all the initial conditions converge to zero at the same rate. You also, uh, you, actually you can construct um, isochronal surfaces, meaning uh, Poincaré sections where the time it takes to, hit the, to go around and hit the section is the same no matter where you start. But the problem is that there's a infinite uh, collection. There's a one parameter family of them. So these, these curves correspond to different logarithmic spirals. And so you can set up spirals that have the, 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 the identical return time property um, that have different pitches, so to speak. So it's well known um, uh, that you can only define the asymptotic phase for a limit cycle, not for a spiral sink. But the fascinating thing is that if you include noise, if there's any stochastic forcing whatsoever, then the picture changes completely. And in fact, you can define uniquely a well-defined uh, asymptotic phase, even for a linear um, stochastic process. So that's what I'm gonna try to get across in the second half of the talk, which is, in this slide over here. Okay, so everything different now. Um, so we're gonna take a linear system and we're just gonna add um, general uh, noise to it. So see here is white noise. And so now instead of decaying to the center, of course, the oscillation keeps pushing me away and I keep circulating. And at least parts of the trajectory have this nice oscillatory ring for them, a ring to them. Um, there's a, the power spectrum has a nice clean peak and um, if you look at the, the, the asymptotic phase that we get from our eigenfunction decomposition, then it evolves uh, at a constant rate, um, uh, whereas the, in black here you see the geometric phase, which is a bit more jagged. Okay, so you can read the paper to see all the gory details of how we, how we parameterize these uh, two-dimensional systems to get a handle on them. Um, but the, the point is that in order to define the asymptotic phase, we have to diagonalize the generator and we can, or, and or the forward Kolmogorov operator. And because this, the, the deterministic part of the system is just linear, we can do it all analytically. Um, and so the, the punchline is that the eigenfunctions for the backward operator can be written out explicitly and they are just linear combinations of the coordinates. Uh, and the forward, the eigenfunctions, the Slosikang eigenfunction for the forward operator is also a linear uh, combination of the coordinates multiplied by this exponential, this, this Gaussian um, envelope. So the backward operator has eigenfunctions that have imaginary or complex arguments that necessarily always form straight lines, spokes of a wheel. And you can extract an expression for what that asymptotic phase looks like as a function of the geometric phase. Here theta is just the standard geometric phase in, in polar coordinates. And so here are some pictures. Uh, here's the, the phase lines, the isochrons for a linear uh, stochastic process just a decaying spiral sink, but for, with noise forcing. And here we're plotting the density of the isochrons. The forward phase also has spokes of a wheel, but its isochrons have, are, are pitched together at a somewhat different phase in the backward phase. So um, these are, this, this approach gives us uh, surprisingly uniquely defined isochrons as long as there is, as long as there is noise. And that is the main message. So I'll, end on this slide, but hopefully there's time for, for questions. Um, so what we've shown is that 
this idea of diagonalizing the generator of the Markov process gives you a notion of asymptotic phase that you can apply not only to limit cycle systems, like I showed, and heteroclinic cycle systems, um, where there's no underlying limit cycle um, without the noise, but even to a simple spiral sink, um, where you can't define the phase in the, under the deterministic setting. And as I mentioned, Cato and Nakao have extended this idea also to quantum mechanical oscillators. Okay, so that's, that's that. Great, uh, thanks Peter, that, that's a really fascinating talk. I got quite a few emails saying that as well. Um, does anyone have any questions to ask? Oh, Victor's got one. So, yeah, he's got one. Could yeah. I? Oh, sorry. So, sorry. Have to. Do we have to put? Yeah, it go in? ahead. Die, jump right in. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, Peter. Thank, thanks for the great talk. Yeah, I think this gives a great start to to this topic. Um. So, what I find, I mean, it just jumps to my mind is, of course, that now that you can also analyze the spiraling things. Um, have you ever put that together into a Hopf bifurcation problem where you look at the spiraling sink and then it, there's a transition to the, to the limit cycle and the sink becomes repelling and then compare these two scenarii like with the same kind of method so that you have kind of the full picture for yeah, a Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. We, we have not um, systematically done this for the Hopf bifurcation. I think that would be a really interesting thing to do. Um, we have observed in specific neural models where you have a subcritical hop bifurcation um, in like the morris Car system or the hodgkin huxley system, well, in 2D systems, we've looked at like morris Car, that you get a mixture of modes. You get a complex conjugate pair representing the spiking oscillation, mm -hmm. but the subthreshold oscillation, which is the spiral sink, might be at a different frequency. And as mm -hmm. you approach the bifurcation, which, um, you have two complex conjugate pairs and they're changing in their uh, uh, decay frequency. And so they move around relative to each other on the complex conjugate plane. And we haven't studied that in detail. We've just observed it numerically. And that would be a really interesting thing to look at. Oh yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. More questions. The question from Victor in your chat. Ah, in my chat. Ah, I have to find the chat. Do you want to read it oh, out loud? Peter, Victor says, Peter, great talk. In any of the results you showed, are there any constraints on the noise amplitude not being too large? Ah, okay. So um, this is not a weak noise asymptotic expansion. Um, uh, it, I think that's what that question suggests to me. Um, so if the noise is weak, then you can maybe there's you can do more um, in some cases but uh, no there's no there's no limitation uh, in fact if the noise is very very small then the eigenfunctions get uh, harder to compute numerically so actually it works a little bit better with with more noise um, in the uh, the limit cycle example here from the 2014 paper um, the noise is quite large, uh, so you have only 25 ion channels, right? So each time an ion channel sw switches state, that's a, a you know a significant jump in the in the state. So the noise is is rather substantive there. So there's no the only small parameter is that we want the other modes to be decaying quickly, so that the dominant stochastic mode as you approach the steady state is sort of cleanly determined by one conjugate. Uh, one one like complex eigen mode. So there is a small parameter in that sense, but the noise doesn't have to be small. Okay, that kind of makes sense. I have a quick question. We've got two minutes. Um, how would because you, you've looked at the how would the stochastic realizations? Can you sort of link in the stochastic picture with the the PDE picture you have for the Fokker Planck equation? Well, sorry, the Kolmogorov equation. Like if, if you, if you um, linking the two, so they both involve the backward operator. They both involve this this uh, generalization of the Koopman operator or the generator of the Markov process. Um, uh, you might ask whether or not you get the same isochrons for both approaches, and for planar systems. So we have an unpublished result. Well, it, it's in Alex Ko's master's thesis, um, so it's published in that sense. Um, for a planar system. The isochrons are identical if, and for the, for the mean return time isochrons and the eigenfunction expansion isochrons, 
they coincide if and only if the eigenfunctions are complex analytic. That is to say, if they satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, that's a sufficient condition. It might not be necessary. So they, so if they satisfy, if the eigenfunctions are complex analytic, then the two coincide. Why, what this means, I have no idea. So um, if someone could explain that to me, uh, I would be grateful. Interesting. Yeah, thanks. That was a really, really great talk, Peter. Thank you. I think we'd better switch to uh, Zara now. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so I'll stop sharing my screen. And what Zara, do we need to do so that Zara can? I think Zara needs to click, click share, and make herself the share her screen. I hope. I hope that'll work. Hey. Can yeah. you see my screen now? Oh, yep. Very great. nice. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Uh, okay. And do you also see me? I mean. I I can't see your face. Um, I can hear you. Uh, Your video may not be on. So I think I tried to uh, turn it on, but I'm not allowed. Oh, okay. So that's probably something I have to do as a host. Just a second. Zara. Um, I'm making you the host now. So now you should be able to turn your video on. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you very much uh, to Peter and James for organizing this new symposium. I will turn to symposium and thank you all for attending. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, phase reduction uh, for noisy oscillators. And this is a joint work with Philip Holmes and by Pav Shirivastava. Um, and this is a very uh, new work uh, of us. So let me start with an example. Uh, which why we um, were motivated to uh, study noisy oscillators. So we use uh, oscillator models to model uh, the behavior of insect locomotion. So, for example, each leg in the uh, each in each insect we are interested in uh, flies and cockroaches, for example, uh, they can be modeled as, as an oscillator. And each leg, uh, if I want to talk about a simplified version of our model, uh, it's governed by a network of neurons, which is called central pattern generators, or CPGs for short. And uh, we usually <clears throat> model each CPG with a system of ODEs um, consisting of four uh, equations. And then we consider a, a coupling of each leg to its neighbors. This is what uh, you can see I mean, this is our network. Each leg uh, is connected to its nearest leg. So we have uh, six legs in total. So we uh, model these six coupled legs with uh, 24 equations. So each oscillator is in fact uh, a burst, which is a, a sequence of spikes followed by uh, a quiescent duration. So each CPG is modeled by the bursting neural model and the burst portion is corresponding to the stance and the quiescent portion is corresponding to the swing. So phase reduction is very important for us because we have a 24 dimensional equation and as Peter mentioned, uh, it's important to um, um, reduce these high dimensional model uh, to low dimensional model. So we, re we use uh, the techniques of phase reduction to reduce 24 equations to six coupled equations. And we realized that the steady state phase differences in this coupled oscillator, for example, phi i minus phi j uh, for different i and j's in the system, uh, this determine the uh, locomotion gate. We get different gate patterns from different steady state phase differences. However, we realized that uh, in, in animal data, these phase differences are quite noisy. For example, here 
I'm showing you uh, these are unpublished data uh, and they are the phase differences in uh, dorsal pillar gates in different uh, speeds and they are quite noisy. So our goal is to understand how noise influences uh, the properties of these oscillators and if we can use uh, the noise uh, as a control mechanism to change these properties. So that's why we are interested in uh, studying uh, phase reduction for uh, noisy oscillators. All right, um, so we uh, saw a very uh, nice review of phase reduction and phase reduction techniques, but let me just uh, to mention uh, my notations, uh, review it uh, again uh, very briefly. So <clears throat> consider a generic oscillator model, x dot equals f of x. It's an n-dimensional system, nonlinear, and it's uh, uh, admit an asymptotically stable um, periodic orbit with period t and I show the limit cycle through the type by uh, big gamma and the period with, uh, with T and frequency omega. So on this limit cycle, let's fix a reference point. Uh, and uh, for any other point on the limit cycle, let's say X, the time that it takes to reach to X from a reference point is T and the phase is a map which is defined on the limit cycle and is in fact uh, the time that it needs to reach to the point X from uh, a reference point, uh, which is phases uh, theta bar. So phi of X is omega times T plus theta bar. Uh, this is defined, uh, this, is, this gives the definition of phase map on the limit cycle. However, we can uh, extend the definition of the map on uh, a basin of attraction of the limit cycle using the asymptotic phase uh, that we, we heard about that. So um, for any point on the basin of attraction, uh, there is a point on the limit cycle that the trajectories are starting from these two points converge to each other after the transition time. So the phase of such points is the same as the phase of the corresponding point on the limit cycle and in fact the level set of all uh, uh, the level set of phi of x is called the isochron, which uh, I think uh, uh, we all heard about that uh, in the previous talk. All right, uh, so, uh, so what happens to a point on the limit cycle if we make a perturbation uh, to the limit cycle? So here we have this orange uh, dot. If you make a perturbation, it may, not, it may not stay on the same isochron here. The dashed curves are isochrons and it may jump to another isochron on the, uh, of the limit cycle, okay? And now, um, um, the, asymptotic, the, new, the, the asymptotic phase of uh, the, the jumped point here may lead, if, for example, in this case, or like the current phase. So the phase response curve is um, the change in asymptotic phase. And it, in fact, it measures the difference between, with, between these two asymptotic uh, phases on the limit cycle. And uh, it's, it's the, the gradient of the phase map evaluated at any point on the limit cycle. So uh, I just want you to um, look at this notation of Z of theta, the, the phase response curve. So Z of theta, uh, is defined on any point on the limit cycle, but the gradient of phi is defined on the basis of attraction of the limit cycle. And we compute the gradient of phi on the limit cycle and we call it Z of theta, okay? And um, the phase response scale, of course, can be defined for any point on the li limit cycle. You make perturbation on any point on the limit cycle and you measure this a phase difference, and this gives the phase response curve here. Uh, I, I computed the phase response curve for bursting neural model for insect uh, locomotion, for example. And uh, there is another way to compute phase response curve. Uh, it's just uh, computing the gradient of the phase map, and it's called uh, the adjoint equation. Uh, phase response curve is, in fact, the solution of this adjoint equation, which is not stable because it, it has a minus uh, Jacobian of F, and we know that the Jacobian of F uh, has uh, negative uh, eigenvalues, negative real part eigenvalues, because F is a, um, a stable system. So this is an unstable, so we need to uh, solve this equation in reverse time to get 
uh, phase response scale. And here is some conditions for the initial condition uh, of, the, of uh, the phase response curve. Okay, we use a phase response curve to reduce a system, uh, a high dimensional system x dot equals f of x, which is perturbed by this term epsilon times g, and we assume that epsilon is small, so we have weak perturbation, and we want to make sure that we stay on the basis of attraction of the limit cycle, and the reduced equation is uh, uh, omega, which is the frequency of the limit cycle, plus epsilon times the phase response curve times uh, the perturbation. So this perturbation could be any local perturbation or the perturbation which comes from uh, the other oscillators in the system. For example, here in our uh, coupled oscillator, each oscillator is uh, perturbed by uh, the neighboring legs. And uh, this technique uh, helped us a lot to reduce the 24 equations to only six equations and to understand uh, the locomotion gate patterns. All right, so, uh, so let me move on to uh, noisy oscillators. So we have this stochastic differential equation, again, n-dimensional, nonlinear, uh, f of x is uh, our vector field when there is no perturbation, and sigma times b times dw is the stochastic part. Sigma is a constant, uh, we call it noise intensity, and we assume that this is small, so we are just talking about a weak uh, type of perturbation. And B of X is uh, the matrix, uh, the diffusion matrix, which depends on uh, our state variable X. And DW is a n-dimensional vector of independent winner uh, increments. So to reduce um, this system to, uh, the to a phase uh, equation, we need to introduce the second order phase response here. So let's say the first phase response curve Z that I talked about so far is the first order uh, phase response curve because it's the gradient, the, the first derivative of the phase map. And here, the second order phase response curve is in fact uh, the Hessian of the phase map evaluated at, evaluated at any point on the limit cycle. So it's the second derivative of the phase map. And I show it by H uh, of theta uh, for the rest of the talk. So here is the phase uh, equation of this noisy oscillator. Uh, the drift term contains two terms, omega, which is the frequency of the limit cycle when there is no perturbation. And this term here, sigma squared divided by two times trace of the diffusion matrix. H is the second order phase response curve and B is again the diffusion matrix. And the diffusion part is uh, sigma, the noise intensity times the phase response curve times the diffusion matrix. So we see that the, the second uh, phase response curve appears in the drift and the first, first phase response curve, I just call it PRC, is uh, appearing in the diffusion. So the idea, so our goal is to uh, look at the matrix B of X and use it as a control mechanism to achieve desired properties for our oscillator. So I will get back to that and give an example later in the talk. So this matrix B is very important for us uh, and uh, it's important to be dependent on the state variable X. All right, so you may wonder uh, what is the difference between <clears throat> this phase equation and the phase equation which exists in the literature. So let me uh, just give a very brief uh, comparison <clears throat> between these two uh, approaches. So uh, in literature, what I found so far is that uh, people usually consider the SDE, uh, uh, this SDE, where the noise is interpreted in terms of Estertanovich. And then they apply the phase reduction technique to this SDE, which then they just need to use the ordinary uh, calculus and ordinary chain rule because it's the Sturtonovich uh, um, sense of noise. And then they convert the obtained phase equation, which is still in terms of Sturtonovich, into ETO by adding uh, this correction term. So the correction term depends on um, the diffusion matrix, the PRC, and their derivative. So in our approach, uh, we consider SDE where the noise is int interpreted, interpreted in terms of ETO. So we don't need to convert it to Stratanovich, 
But on the other hand, we cannot use uh, ordinary phase equation, phase reduction. We need to use ETO formula, ETO calculus to, uh, to drive the phase equation. And here is what we get. Uh, so the difference is just these two blue terms. We have the trace of B-transpose HP as, as I explained in, in the previous slide. So the, um, the second order uh, PRC appears here. So here, as you see in the second equation, in our approach, B doesn't need to be differentiable as it, it needs in the first equation. And even for a constant B, we know that if B is constant, uh, the two uh, interpre interpretations are equivalent. So this original equation is equivalent in terms of Estertonovich and Ito if B is constant. However, their um, phase equations are not equivalent. So they are, these two are not identical necessarily, even for constant B. All right, so, so let me explain how to compute the second order phase response curve. So we know that PRC, we can uh, solve an adjoint equation uh, in reverse time and compute PRC. So we can find similar type of equation to compute second order PRC. And here is the equation um, <clears throat> in this line. It's a little bit more complicated than adjoint equation. It involves the Hessian of the vector field F. It involves the first order PRC as well and also the Jacobian of F. And here is um, uh, the, the constraint for the initial uh, value. And this, um, this proposition uh, is proved by uh, Dan Wilson and Bard and Matra in their 2018 uh, paper. All right. Um, so let me give you a very simple example. This is a uh, Van der Poel oscillator with multiplicative noise, so sigma times beta one, which beta one could depend on the state variables x1 and x2. Uh, so if I want to um, write it in terms of vector, it's x dot is f of x dt, um, or dx is f of x dt, plus sigma bx dw, which b is uh, a diagonal matrix. So since the uh, diffusion matrix is a diagonal matrix here, uh, in the drift only, uh, two components of uh, second order phase response curve ap uh, appear. So I just computed uh, the diagonal entries of, uh, phase, uh, of second order phase response curve here. So uh, here are H11 and H22, and here are the two com components for the first order phase response curve, which appear in the diffusion. So the computed phase response curves, uh, in fact, uh, provide insight into how to design the stochastic perturbation in order uh, to get um, desired properties of our oscillators. So for example, if you want to uh, reduce the diffusion and uh, maximize the drift or minimize the drift, how we can choose beta one and beta two uh, given um, the, the first order and second order phase response curves in, in this way. So uh, I think this is very important. Um, question to answer, uh, and this is something that we will focus on uh, later, um, I mean, in our research, not in this talk necessarily. This is another example, the bursting neural model, uh, which is type of uh, Hushkin-Huxley equation, and we used it for uh, uh, insect locomotion. And again, we can compute phase response curve and second phase response curve, and we can uh, get, um, we can choose appropriate uh, diffusion matrix B to get desired properties uh, for our uh, oscillator. All right, so there is one more thing that I want to talk about, and it's the time period of noisy oscillators, which we are interested in. And this gives that when is the next time that uh, the neuron would, would, uh, would fire. And this is important again for our um, insect locomotion uh, and the, the, the escape patterns. So we interpret the time period as a first passage time uh, and then compute its uh, statistics. So here, um, if we look at, <clears throat> if you look at, the, um, I mean, this is the, uh, the, the general definition, t of theta zero is the, the interim time uh, for a trajectory 
uh, which uh, start from theta zero and it reaches two pi. So if you start from zero, what is the interim time to reach two pi? This gives, um, this gives the, the, the time period of um, our, our noisy oscillator. And here is uh, uh, just a graph which shows that if you start from zero, there will be a different sample path. And what is uh, the first time that a sample path which hit uh, the boundary two pi? So if you look at the distribution of the time period, uh, I mean tau theta zero, the probability that tau is greater than uh, t starting from theta zero, uh, this is uh, denoted by g of theta zero and t, and this is a solution of a backward Fokker Planck equation, uh, which uh, the first term here, the coefficient to dg d theta zero is our drift, and the second term, uh, the second coefficient is the diffusion squared, which I show it here. And we assume that the initial conditions are, um, it is just uh, one and the boundary conditions are observing boundary conditions and they are both zero. So if you solve this uh, fokker planck equation, of course we get the distribution of the time period and we know everything about the time period. However, it might not be easy to uh, compute this um, equation, I mean, uh, to solve this equation and we may, only interested in some moments of the time period. So using this equation, we can uh, drive an ODE for our uh, time period, which is given here. So you see this is exactly uh, the equation that we had, uh, and the boundary conditions are zero, and it's much easier to uh, solve this equation and to compute, for example, the mean uh, given here and uh, the second moment of the time the time period uh, given in the second equation. And um, as you see in the first and second equation, again, we can see uh, the drift term, which involves the um, diffusion matrix B and also the second order phase response curve, and also the drift term, uh, sorry, the drift term and the diffusion term, which they involve uh, uh, respectively the second order phase response curve and the first, first order uh, phase response curve. Um, get back to the, no, uh, to the noisy van der Poel, uh, Poel oscillator. Uh, we computed the um, first moment and second moment of the time period and compared it, compared it with Monte Carlo simulation. And we see that for a small enough sigma, uh, which we assume from the beginning, uh, the, the theory matches well with the uh, simulation. All right, so let me um, conclude here. So we uh, drive a relatively new phase equation for noisy oscillators, uh, weakly perturbed noisy oscillators, uh, using first order and second order phase response curves. Uh, for the second phase response curves, we uh, showed um, an ODE, which uh, its solution is the second order phase response curve. And we gave uh, analytical approximation for the moments of the time period. So the future directions, uh, Mm, contains mm, extending these results to coupled oscillators. As I told you in the beginning of the talk, we are interested in uh, understanding the effect of noise on uh, the synchronization and phase locking on the um, animal locomotion and their gate patterns. So we would like to extend all these results uh, in coupled oscillators. And uh, the other thing is to use the um, diffusion matrix B uh, as a control mechanism uh, to um, change uh, the properties of the oscillation, the oscillation and in particular change the properties of uh, the, uh, the gates in uh, insects. So this is the, the step that we are, we are taking right now. Uh, <clears throat> we take uh, the couple, coupling oscillators, again weak coupling, and this weak coupling may be buried by uh, noise. So uh, this is corresponding uh, to the interaction noise uh, between the oscillators. And we also have uh, a common noise. So we assume that all the oscillators are driven by a common noise. And um, here is the equation that we get. <clears throat> and we would like to study the synchronization behavior and phase lacking of uh, these coupled equations. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Zara. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So you Thank have you. a question here from Peter, if you see in the comment. Um, 
So he says on. I have a question. Oh, I have a question about slide going back to slide twelve with the first passage time problem. <clears throat> and, and thank you for a nice talk. Thank you. <clears throat> Here, right? Yeah. So um, about the boundary conditions, I, I was trying to figure out whether or not the trajectories get absorbed at both uh, two pi and zero. That is to say, can I wander in both directions and count as um, a spike, so to speak? Or do I only have a spike registered if I'm going crossing two pi, say, from below? <clears throat> so I think, uh, so sorry, I should have explained uh, better here. So this is not zero. This is minus k pi when k goes to infinity. So it's from minus infinity to, um, to zero. I see. As minus so you have, you've un unwrapped the domain so that you could sort of wander backwards. Noise could take you backwards and then forwards and you have to make up the ground you lost before it counts as a spike. Yes, I think so, yeah. So this, okay, this okay. is not zero, right. Thanks. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a very good talk. Um, can you go back to um, slide nine? Yes. Yeah, um, I was wondering like, what does that mean in the proposition two? You have uh, the equation for uh, derivative of the Hessian theta where you have the cross product. Is that out product or what is that? The it's least a least? Uh, Kronecker uh, product to okay. uh, just make it, uh, uh, the, just make the dimensions right. And okay. this is a matrix by the way. So H is a matrix. So this is a, an equation for matrix. Okay. And we can vectorize the equation and get uh, a vector uh, equation, which, uh, I mean, the, the way that we compute this um, and solve this is to uh, couple this equation with the equation, the adjoint equation for Z. So we have a vector for Z and this is coupled with uh, the a vectorized version of H. Is that I just identity matrix? This is identity matrix, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. And also on, on page number 13. 13, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. 13. Uh, uh, I saw that uh, on the mean return time in, the, um, in proposition three, the mean period is um, expected to be sigma square over, over omega square that, and you plus like um, small term of sigma square. Uh, why is that? Uh, why, why did you like? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Like, or, is that the same order? Or? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood. Uh, the, uh, this is little o. Oh, little, not a big o. Right? Oh, so, yeah, this is little o. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I really don't like to use little o. It's confusing. You're absolutely right. No, this this should be big o sigma cube. Right, so it's confusing, but it's little off. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Zara, I have a quick question as well. That's right, going to the last slide. Um, so you have your coupled oscillators um, and you've got synchronization, right? So if you didn't have, if you only, if you only had common noise, did, are you going to get here the Lyapunov function before the rate of synchronization of all the phases? Uh, so this is, uh, just the beginning of the, uh, the research for coupled oscillators. We haven't done any, uh, any calculations, uh, but the idea is that, so I'm, I may not use the Lyapunov exponent, I may use contraction theory for uh, oscillations. And I, I really want to have both sigma and de delta because I know that for example, for the coupled oscillators in insects, uh, there are some noise in the interaction. Sure. Uh, this delta is important for me, uh, for me as well. No, it's, it's extremely interesting. So, so could you explain what's, what's the difference between weak coupling and interaction? Sorry, the, okay, the weak coupling is the deterministic coupling. And this deterministic coupling is buried with noise. So that's how I, I want to explain. I mean, I kind of separated uh, these two terms. So the interaction has two parts, deterministic, which could be like uh, synaptic coupling, uh -huh. And a stochastic part. Ah, yes. No, you're right. This this would have a very good neuroscientific motivation. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, because I mean, I'd just be intrigued. What if you do see synchronization in all the phases? I guess you'd have to look at the 
anyway, I will have to see how, how your work evolves. <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> I will update you. I think in a couple of months, I, uh, I hope I can uh, be able to talk about this. Sure. The okay. next talk, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Okay, any other questions quickly? Okay, well, thank, thanks, Sarah. It was really interesting. Great talk. Um, and maybe thank we'll switch over to Maximilian now. If you can yes. switch him to be the host. Okay, great. Thank you. So can I... So I... Can I start my video now? No, still not. Oh, it's Zara has to... We have to make you the host. Yes, sure. So I'll try to do this. I can see your screen, Maximilian. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, but I think I s I'm still not able to switch on my video. Yeah, I, actually, I'm not sure we saw Zara for a little time either. But, um, yeah. Yes, you're the host, so you should be able to start, hopefully, start your video. OK, wait a second. Um, yeah, perfect. Hello. <laughs> hey, so this is. Uh, so if I go now to, um, yes, perfect. And so can you see everything and it's yeah. not irritating in any way? Oh, seems good to me. Okay, perfect. So then shall I just start? Perfect, yeah, thank you. Okay, great, yeah. Thanks a lot for the invitation and setting this up. I think it's a, it's a really nice replacement of the, of the actual meeting. And so I'm going to talk about a kind of different perspective on these problems of isochronicity for stochastic oscillations. And this is joint work with um, Christian Kuhn, also from TU Munich. I will soon start a new position at uh, FU Berlin. So that's where to contact me <laughs> from July on, actually. So this will be my last TU Munich talk. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I'm happy to, to share some ideas uh, with you here. Um, so the... Um, contents of this talk uh, will comprise a little introduction um, to motivate why we looked at this kind of problem a little bit differently um, and uh, repeat some of the ideas uh, that have already come up in the, in the previous talks on isochrons for deterministic systems, but I want to revisit that also to really make clear how we transfer that to some other forms of stochastic analysis. Um, and then I will in detail describe what we would call random isochrons, not to, um, not to compete with the stochastic isochrons that you have introduced, but kind of, yeah, building a complementary picture and then end with some summary and outlook. So as we have seen before, and I think this was introduced very nicely, um, just consider an ODE um, with a, a smooth vector field and some attracting limit cycle and a, a period, uh, we call it tor, tor gamma, uh, corresponding with the limit cycle gamma. And I will just introduce a very easy example, um, which then I can reuse also for our um, random consideration. So let's assume uh, we have a phase amplitude, uh, so polar coordinate uh, representation. And in the R variable, we just say it's like a Hopf normal form. Um, with a positive alpha. So we are in the limit cycle case. And then in the angular variable, we have some dynamics which should not, uh, which should be kind of uh, bounded away from, from zero such that we actually turn around on our limit cycle. 
Um, so in this case, we have these isotrons crossing um, the limit cycle at the radius square root of alpha. And yeah, as we've seen before, so for example, if the, um, if the uh, uh, angular momentum or angular, angular speed would be, would be constant, uh, then we have just straight lines being these isochrons. Um, and when we don't have that, so if there's some change uh, at square root of alpha in our, in our speed, then these isochrons might bend. Um, and uh, the, the question, question has now been, as we have already seen, um, how to extend these, uh, these phenomena to the stochastic case. So if the, if the ordinary differential equation is exposed to noise and becomes a stochastic differential equation, I prefer the Stratonovich way of writing this um, because we want to um, also refer to differentiable properties of the system um, by considering Lapinov exponents and stable manifolds. And yeah, that's why the Stratonovich way is a little bit more convenient, but of course can be transformed to the Ito case. Um, so uh, yeah, we assume in this SDE that we have, we have just independent real value of ground motions driving the process uh, in addition to this vector field and that we have um, yeah, nice bounded growth conditions on all our coefficients such that solutions exist. And for such a problem, exactly, the question has been how to define stochastic isochrons. And we have seen that there have been several um, ideas how to treat this. And um, the way we treat that now comes from a kind of different perspective. Um, so I want to say that, that what we have seen before and has been mainly done by, uh, by yeah, Peter Thomas, Benjamin Lindner, Akali Bikowski, um, was to look at maybe more the statistical properties of, of, of the problem, we would say, uh, in the sense that the Kolmogorov operators have been looked at. Um, and uh, so Kolmogorov operator or generator for the process L being the one acting on observables, also yeah, called uh, the stochastic Koopman operator or yeah, just the backward Kolmogorov operator. And uh, it's a formal at two adjoint, the L star, um, which is then the Fokker Planck operator or forward Kolmogorov operator, which acts on the probability densities. And with these, you can understand many phenomena in the stochastic setting. Um, but there's also this different point of view, which looks at the so called random dynamical system, which is induced uh, as a solution of the stochastic differential equation uh, as an omega wise. Um, Solution. So for each for each omega in our probability space, we kind of define a flow property, um, which uh, is now a non-autonomous flow property, um, where we have to we have to consider actually that there's a time shift in our probability space. So this is indicated here by a theta s omega in this kind of flow property, which we call co-cycle property, and this allows us then for for any fixed omega, so for any noise realization, actually to compare for different initial conditions the dynamics of our system. And this point of view has been introduced uh, by Arnold in the late 90s, or I mean, it had been introduced before in certain ways, but, but there has been this, 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 this main book on this since the end of the 90s. And yeah, in the last couple of years, we have more and more tried to make this kind of point of view um, applicable to, to different stochastic problems. Um, so just to give you an idea with our example, how these two views compare. So if we now add uh, some multiplicative noise on our um, amplitude uh, radial coordinate, um, then we can actually look at something we would call random limit cycle. So for each omega, we can solve the first equation, the R equation, um, to find actually a so-called random equilibrium. So so some uh, some solution which is defined for each omega and which uh, as a as a um, sort of stationary solution of this of this R problem actually um, yeah solves 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 the solves the problem in a random dynamical system sense and so we get a random limit cycle uh, for each omega realization with a particular um, radius of omega and um, this can then look like that. So we could say that there's some sort of uh, pullback convergence to this, to this uh, random limit cycle. So what we mean by that is that um, we go backwards in time uh, in our noise space and then go forwards in time along the dynamics. And by that, we can fix an omega 
at a certain zero fiber and actually get fixed objects a alpha of omega um, which yeah which depend on omega but are really random limit cycles uh, for each kind of omega realization so they they lie around um, the, the the actual original deterministic limit cycle but for each omega they are kind of a perturbation of the original one um, so if we, for example, start uh, at some time with an approximation of the stationary density, which comes from the stationary Fokker-Planck equation, then you would see that there's a convergence to this limit cycle for each omega noise realization for these different initial conditions. Whereas on the operator side or density side, we have this complete stationarity and you don't see any change in the picture. So um, yeah, taking this point of view, we have revisited um, the problems of isochron. So if we go back again to the ODE setup, um, then just to remind you that for this limit cycle, we can define the isochron as a cross section at the limit cycle where the return time for all points at this cross section is the same and it's actually equaling the period of the limit cycle. Um, so just to give you the picture again, in the case of our example where there would be a, um, a repelling equilibrium point at, uh, in the middle at the origin um, and there would be um, convergence to this limit cycle from both sides. We could draw such a cross-section as our isochron seen before. Um, but there's also this different kind of idea which, which has been also mentioned already in, in Peter's talk at the beginning but I want to um, sorry formalize that a little bit more. Um, yeah, but before I do that, sorry, <laughs> before I do that, I just want to say um, again that coming from this from this kind of um, point of view, so looking at these at these return times, we've already seen that if you go now to the stochastic situation, um, then you have to you have to think about this kind of mean return time problem, um, and uh, what you can do is that for for any subset in your state space, you will now look at the return time as a as a random variable. Uh, so as the kind of first hitting time of coming back to our first return time coming back to a certain set for the process, which is then a random variable. And to make any fixed term out of that, you have to look at expectations. So um, formalizing a little bit the bukowski schwabeda um, approach, the stochastic isochrons would then be um, yeah, sections of the same um, expected mean Return, well, yeah, mean return time or expected return time, um, where for any for any isochron, um, yeah, this return time is really in expectation given by a particular constant, and we could call it T bar. Um, and uh, yeah, this uh, has been established rigorously as we already saw today by by Carl Thomas Lindner, um, and now being published. So this should be 2000, 2020. Um, but our question is, how can we now connect this to this random dynamical system point of view? Because this comes from an expected point of view. This is related to properties of the generator of a Planck operator and the backward Kolmogorov operator. And uh, yeah, what is the kind of approach that, uh, that we would take if we want to understand for each omega or each trajectory what is happening to, to these uh, random limit cycles? And um, what we use is to, to formalize this again a little bit more is really the stable manifold point of view that was mentioned at the very beginning in, in, uh, uh, in Peter's talk, but, but, but um, yeah, which um, can really be transformed to, to, to the random case very nicely. So again, look at this uh, hyperbolic limit cycle, and then we can say that for each point on the limit cycle, the isochron is really the stable set uh, for this point. So anything in the neighborhood of uh, this, uh, this limit cycle will converge to the limit cycle and in particular for, for a point uh, on this limit cycle. If we take um, the right initial conditions, then we will see that there's convergence to the trajectory of this point on the limit cycle from these, uh, from these different initial conditions, which then will form actually the, the isochron. And one can show that this is a um, smooth or CK um, manifold, which is transverse to our limit cycle. Um, and then you can actually foliate your state space around this limit cycle by these uh, different stable sets into the stable manifold of, of your gamma. Um, and connected to that, as we already have, have seen as well, 
um, is the so-called isochrome. I, I would call it isochrome map in this in this setting now, um, which uh, yeah, it's really the clock um, uh, which organizes the dynamics around your limit cycle and gives each point in this uh, stable neighborhood of the of the limit cycle a, a unique time. Uh, which is uh, corresponding with the time parameterization of your of your limit cycle, and just to recall that um, briefly again, because we we need it in a second to to really see the transformation to the random case. So the properties of this of this isochron map are that uh, the isochrons are exactly the level sets of this um, of this map. Um, for for each point on the on the limit cycle, and of course along um, trajectories along solutions of our ODE, um, the isochron map actually has derivative or time derivative one or constant at least, and we we always rescale it here to one. Um, and this is now giving us um, certain ideas for how to continue with a random dynamical system. So we had the stable manifold aspect and we now have this isochron map aspect and these are things we can really actually try to transform to this uh, trajectory wise approach around around random limit cycles so uh, the one aspect is the random stable manifold aspect and the other one is really the characterization by the random isochron map as far as we can define it and yeah this is uh, the setup so Let's assume we have this random dynamical systems interpretation, um, or for example, coming from an SDE, but it's actually even a little bit more general. Uh, but as long as there's a, a nice regular SDE, we can always take this point of view. Uh, and then we assume that there is this attracting random limit cycle. Um, so we have some, some form of omega perturbation of the, of the original limit cycle and really can, can see a sort sort of random attractor being a limit cycle for each omega, um, as you saw in the example. And then we would define the random isochron uh, for each pair of um, noise realization omega and point x, where x lies on the A of omega, so on the particular fiber of the random limit cycle, as the stable set, but now the stable set with respect to the random dynamics. So for each omega, and uh, this initial condition X, we look at all the condition, initial conditions Y, which under the same noise realization, um, converge to the trajectory starting at this X. Um, and um, to give you a little bit of a picture, um, we can say that there's a certain invariance of these objects in the random dynamical systems or non-autonomous sense. So it gets a little bit formal here um, and I, I think this is sometimes maybe a little bit repelling <laughs> uh, regarding this point of view, um, but I think it's really worth because it's, it's, it's adding a little bit of a different, different picture. Um, so if you take one of these random um, stable sets or random isochrons in, in this case now, um, as, as these cross sections of a fiber uh, of the random limit cycle, and then you apply the random dynamics, you get to a new fiber and there, um, at this new realization of this, of this random limit cycle, you really shift the whole um, random isochron um, invariantly in this non-autonomous sense to the same object now at the new fiber theta t omega. Um, yeah, and this is the kind of invariance we would look at here in the non-autonomous sense. So you have, to, you have to see that this random limit cycle really, because you have non-autonomous dynamics coming from the noise, you're really coming from one random limit cycle realization to the next if you follow the dynamics, and we can track these random isochrons along there. And um, we can not only do that, but actually characterize them as, as random stable manifolds. So what do I mean by that? Um, so if we have that our RDS is ergodic, so it has an ergodic invariant measure, which actually is then, again, um, precisely corresponding with um, an ergodic solution of the stationary Fokker Planck equation. And we assume it has this random limit cycle, and we can um, realize the, we can, we can, we can uh, use the multiplicative ergodic theorem and have a first Lapunov exponent being zero. So now, in the random sense, Lapunov exponent for the random system, and having um, the other Lapunov exponents being smaller than zero, so having this kind of hyperbolic. Uh, random limit cycle, then uh, we can actually 
uh, use these rates. Uh, yeah, anything that is that is between zero and uh, the, the 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 largest non. Um, zero Lepinov exponent to get exponential convergence of our trajectories, um, being then indeed our our random isochron or random stable set, um, and these are actually CK manifolds. So we really established quite generally for this problem that uh, for each omega, um, these um, random isochrons are manifolds with exponentially fast convergence to the random limit cycle, um, and this is not really so much uh, innovative work in our sense, but, but I think still you have to put it together. So, so there you have to put together some of the random dynamical systems literature to really, to really get this case coherent here. Um, the other thing is now that we want to understand actually the whole problem also in terms of periodic solutions. So just a second, so these random cycles here, we don't really know what, what could be a, a periodic solution in this sense. I mean, it has been said that this is hard to transfer to the <laughs> random case. So, so what we have done, we have, we have extended the idea of the periodic solution to a random periodic solution. This has been done before, but now we really, to, to make it most general, uh, we have really also um, used um, a, a period which depends also on the omega realization. So, so we define a Kraul random periodic solution in, in honor of Hans Kraul, who first came up with ideas uh, with, respect to, with respect to random periodic solutions with, uh, with period, which depends on the random realization, um, and, and, and define it like that. So I just give you a picture, uh, because the, the, <laughs> the formulas are sometimes a little bit hard to read. Um, so um, if you assume that you have this A of omega, then we say that the Kral random periodic solution lives on that um, as, as a solution of our system um, such that the, the T of zero omega is equal to the C of the T of omega omega. So the T of omega is now a noise dependent period where you go around once in, in exactly the time T of omega. And if you now apply the random dynamics and you come to the new fiber, then um, you get to psi of t theta t omega. Um, and there, again, you have the period capital T of omega um, as, uh, as your return period for the, for the omega-wise problem. And we just want to demonstrate that this kind of definition makes sense um, by using our example, which I've shown you at the beginning. So the, the Hopf example with some multiplicative noise and some uh, angular speed, which is bounded away from zero, can generalize that a little bit, of course. Um, and then we can show that this actually has the scroll random periodic solution. And um, this is given by, of course, on the one part, our R star omega, which is our random equilibrium in the R direction. Um, and then at the same uh, time, so the, the, um, the, the angular parts or the phase parts, actually given by integrating from the past to the present along our, um, along our random equilibrium in R. So I mentioned at the beginning that we have this pullback way of looking at things very often to fix something at a particular present omega. We have to go back in time on our noise space and then go forward. And this is exactly reflected here. This is the way, and I think it's the only way how you can define such a random periodic solution. Um, and then in particular, we get our um, noise dependent period um, as exactly then the time where we have to go back here in this integral such that we have made one two pi movement. Um, yeah, so, so if you're interested in that to, to, to understand this a little bit better, this, this is described in the paper. Um, I just want to, to finish now with, the, with, the, with, with how we can use that for the for the um, isochron map in the random case. And um, the idea is the following. Um, so again, we look at this random dynamical system, RDS, with an attracting random limit cycle. And we assume it has such a Kral random periodic solution. And then we can define now the random isochron map. So this is now um, something which depends on omega, but also on time because of the non-autonomous dynamics. And we define this in a neighborhood of the random limit cycle um, such that we have this asymptotic phase indeed. So this gives us the asymptotic phase, the phi tilde, but now depending on omega and the time where you 
let the dynamics start, we could say, so where you, where we, where you start to follow the non-autonomous dynamics. Um, and at the same time, uh, we again have the level set property. So the level sets of this, um, of this phi tilde, of this random isochron map for each omega t are precisely the random isochrons that we have defined as the stable sets, stable sets for each omega. And we can anchor them now at the random periodic solutions. So we define these uh, random isochrons for each point, uh, for each omega and each point on the random limit cycle. And there we can find this um, crawl random periodic solution. And that's where we anchor our, um, our random isochrons. And then we can show that the level sets um, of our random isochron map are precisely these, these, these sets. Um, and very nicely, we also get, and that's where we, where we see why we have to put in the T as another non-autonomous aspect, we actually get this constant uh, movement of, of our random trajectories along the random isochron map, but taking into account the fiber change um, in our omega space and taking into account at which time we, we look at that. So this is a non-autonomous random way of looking at that. And you can really reproduce the properties of the original asymptotic phase or isochron map now in the random case. And um, maybe just one last comment how this is connected to the mean return time isochrons. So we could look at this problem now here, this kind of equation now in an expected um, kind of way. So not looking at uh, the phi being depending on, on omega or some t, but really only as a deterministic function and looking at the dynamics along random trajectories um, and yeah, requiring that the expectation of this speed here is actually one um, or a constant and then rescale to one. And then via Ito's formula, we actually come to the stationary Dinkins equation and yeah, putting then periodic boundary conditions with some, with some additional tricks, we really get a, a very similar actually result uh, as, as what, what, what Carl and Thomas did. Um, who did it more rigorously in that, in that kind of context, but we just wanted to show that um, yeah, looking at this problem now more from the expected kind point of view, this is uh, contextualized to the other approaches. So one can see that the level sets of such a phi bar are actually the mean return time isochrons, um, which has been yeah, very nicely done in the Carl Thomas Lindner paper. Um, the point now is how does this connect to our random, is uh, random isochron or random dynamical systems point of view? And this is unfortunately something <laughs> we still have to leave open for now. This was very hard to track and we would be very happy to discuss this. Um, namely, um, of course, one could now ask is the phi tilde, so this random isochron map or random iso asymptotic phase, for example, fixing it at a time zero, is this, is this then an expectation exactly the phi bar? So this, um, so the level set uh, of, of which gives you the, the mean return time isochron. And in particular is the expectation of our random period associated with the crawl random periodic solution, exactly the, the capital T bar, which is the expected uh, return time. And uh, in addition, could we find in some set theoretic sense that these random isochrons are actually in expectation giving uh, these, these mean return time isochrons. So these are questions we, we are still trying to figure out. And um, yeah, I, I hope you maybe have some ideas. Um, so just to summarize quickly, so you can look at these isochrons from a maybe more statistical operator kind of approach as before, or from this random dynamical perspective. And this random dynamical systems perspective allows us to uh, treat random isochrons as random stable manifolds to uh, look at random periodic solutions uh, with noise dependent periods, and then to connect this to uh, a so-called random isochron map, which characterize our, our isochrons very nicely dynamically. And the open question is, is there a correct way of averaging these RDS objects to obtain the mean, time, uh, re mean return time isochrons uh, that we have seen before? Um, and also maybe another line of thought is do these stochastic isochrons as, 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 as we saw in the first talk, which have been defined via eigenfunctions of the generator, do they connect to the RDS theory? So the random dynamical systems theory, they're actually looking at the so-called random Koopman operators, which are defined omega wise for the dynamical system. Yeah, so I hope this has been uh, yeah, a new kind of interesting perspective and I thank you very much for your attention.
Great, thanks Maximilian. Uh, we have a question from Peter Thomas. Okay, that was a beautiful talk. Thanks very much, Maximilian. Um, Thank you. In theorem A, which was, I guess, your, your main result, um, you, you show that you can define these uh, random stable isochrons or random isochrons. Um, so Dan Wilson and Jeff Mullis and other people have been doing, and Bard, uh, have been doing a lot of work lately on um, augmented phase reduction where you take other Floquet coordinates besides the, the isochrons and you mm -hmm. can define a whole system of, of phase amplitude coordinates. Um, are there random isostable coordinates that one should be able to pull out of this? Yeah, I think that should be possible. Yeah, I think that should definitely be possible. I think in this direction, Igor Mesic has already um, mm. have some ideas as, as, as far as I remember. I wanted to, to check <laughs> this part of the literature as well. But yeah, I think, I think there, is, there is a way to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm and just as a follow-up, are the uh, eigenvalues lambda i, do they depend on omega also or are they... Are they random? No, or? that's the point. They, so in an ergodic setting, they don't. Okay. In an ergodic setting, they don't. Um, in a, um, if you, so if you're, if, you're, if you're invariant measure with respect to which you define these Lepinov exponents in the multiplicative ergodic theorem, if, they, uh, if this measure is ergodic, then, then you really have these Lepinov exponents being uh, yeah, just deterministic numbers. Um, if the measure is non-ergodic, this becomes a little bit more complicated and they might be omega dependent. Thanks. Um, I have questions, but I think we should switch to Pedro now, our last speaker. But if you're sticking around, Maximilian, I can ask you after Pedro's talk. Yeah, sorry. So if I ran a little bit over. No, yeah, then let's do it like that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we can have an open discussion afterwards. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Sounds great. So if you can make um, Pedro the host, Maximilian, that'd be great. So I have to make him the host? I think so. I'm not sure how. Yeah. Yes. Wait a second. Um. So I go to Zoom. Yes. OK. Perfect. So where do I, So that's Pedro. Yep. Thank you. That's great. Uh, this, I mean, so sorry, I don't see under participants, uh, the panelists panel. So it's on is the it, is it Amit? You know, I don't see Pedro either. Hang on. No, he sees, there's no Pedro. Um, I'll just email him. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. the open discussion might start sooner than we uh, expect. Yeah. Well, we can talk. If there's other questions, please go ahead. Are there? I, I, Pedro says he's here. Ah, oh, sorry. Is he maybe? Ah, uh, he's in the wrong. Is he in? Uh, he's not in. Um, he's in attendee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Uh, so I I promoted him. Wait, he should be a part of the okay. Okay. of the uh, discussion. And I think now I should be able to make him a host. Yes. Hello. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Thanks, Pedro. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good. So Pedro, you should now be the host. Okay, host. now you can hear me and you can see me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Um so I, I should start. Uh, Please, yeah, go. Me. Okay. Um station. Let me share the screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Okay, so thank you thank you for inviting me to to give this talk in this uh, mini symposium which is full of experts in these topics. I am I am not, but um but well, let's see. I would like to um, I would like to talk about this uh, ongoing work with James, which is, uh, can you see my pointer? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I would like to talk about this, uh, this work, which is a synchronization in uh, stochastic biochemical oscillators. Um, 
So let me, let me start by saying what is a biochemical uh, reaction network. Uh, and the, the, the motivation is this classical example, the, the stochastic oscillator, uh, which is a catalytic reaction of two species here, X1 and X2. And if you see in, in the left, this is the, the structure of these uh, reaction networks that shows the, the, in this case, four possible reactions, which, is, which, are, which I would say reaction channels for this network which says how, how the, the species interact and how the species gets, gets transformed. You can read this, for example, the second reaction as one particle of X1 transforms into one particle of X2. Here is, is the decay of one particle of X1. This is the, 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 the birth and so on and so forth. And then if you want to, to model dynamics of this network, uh, the, the most classical model is, is, um, is ordinary differential equations uh, for, for the for, for the concentration of, of, of the, the each species, the, the variable is a, is, a, is a real number, is a concentration, and we have this system of nonlinear uh, ODEs. If, um, if you choose to model this as a, with the mass action law, then, um, then the, the rate or, or the propensity of each reaction channel is essentially proportional to the, to the reactants. So what, what it means is that um, the, the ODE is essentially a polynomial, okay? This is one of the, the classical choices. And for some, for the, the, this, this system has four parameters and for these values of the parameters, you have a, a limit cycle, uh, which is the kind of behavior we are interested in in this work, uh, which is, uh, as everyone knows, um, is a, is a, is a close isolated orbit. And uh, it's very important in, in, in these systems, in this for modeling, by biochemical, bio bio biological system and chemical also because it's a it's a stable oscillation. Okay, so it's, it's a robust because if if you if you start a, a trajectory close to the limit cycle, then you have um, you, you you quickly come back to the to the to the limit. So we can we can write this system more more compactly as in this way by using the, what is called stoichiometry matrix. I will call stoichiometry matrix, which uh, which tells it's a, it's a matrix of integers and tells um, how, how they describes essentially the, the, the reactions. Uh, and then by using this, what I, what I will call propensity function, this, this lambda or rate function, which, which are monomials in this case, because we have mass action law, then we can, we can write this system as, as this, as this uh, equation this, in, in this way. This is convenient for, for my notation. So in general, we have this, uh, this integral description of this system, which is classical. But now the, the main goal of this work is to, is to model um, particle counts and not uh, um, concentrations, okay? So now the variables, which, which are written by X, capital X, because it's a random variable now, we, we want to, we want to, to, to model um, counts of particles. And uh, you, can, you, can, you have a representation, which is called uh, Carr's representation for these systems is uh, recall that this, this X is a discrete variable, it's accounting, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a natural number, it's an integer. And, 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 and philosophically are the same as, as before, this, this integral system, but now here we have a, a unit rate independent Poisson process, okay? So everything looks the same, except that you have a, a random process here. And, uh, and now the, the, the domain of the, of the, of the variables is, is, uh, are integers. Okay, positive integer. Okay, so, and this is how, I mean, it's a Markov chain. So this is how, how, how so one possible evolution of, 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 of this system, uh, this brucellator, it's called stochastic brucellator. And you have low count, I mean, the, the, one of the, of the particularities of, of the stochastic model is that you can, you can model um, extinctions of, of species and, and, and low count, every, any 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 situation in which you want to have a, to, to 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 keep track of what happens when 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 low counts of particles uh, when you have low counts of particles this is just how the system evolves and um, but of course the, the, there is a formal and uh, a connection between the, the the low count system which is this one the x and and the and the large count if you want the concentration system and it's if you properly scale the variable x, then you you go from this. This is a pure. It's also called pure, pure jump process. You can here you see the, the pure jump uh, evolution of this, of the stochastic oscillator. And as long as you start 
uh, increasing the number of particles of both species, then you, you converge to the to the deterministic limit cycle. Okay, so of course there are many intermediate approximations. For, I mean, our base model is, is the discrete one, the, this X, and the, 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 the ODE, this ODE is, is an approximation, but there are other intermediate approximations as for example, the, a diffusion approximation, which this, here you can see the jumps, most of, barely you can see the jumps. Here you, it looks like a diffusion, here it looks like more like an ODE and so on and so forth. So there are many intermediate approximations uh, we, which we'll use in this, in this work for, for computing our, our football. Okay, so you, I, I, will, I, will, I will call this, this capital C, which is a random variable, um, this, this, uh, this scale X. Okay, so this is the systems we are interested here and we have more than one. In this case, we are just computing two uh, oscillators, which are stochastic. Uh, so we have two systems like this. And the, the main goal of this, of this work, which is, a, is, a, is an ongoing collaboration with James, is how we can synchronize these two stochastic oscillators, which are pure jump, by introducing external noise, okay? So how how is this noise? This noise, um, the idea of the, of of the first part of this uh, work is to is to perturb all the reaction channels, the, the reaction rates or intensities, by multiplicatively adding um, a switching noise. Okay, so the the extrinsic noise is a, is a is a switch between these two values. These are two constants, sigma k minus sigma k and plus sigma k. Uh, and this, this, this switching noise is, uh, has zero mean. And for convenience, the, the, the stochastic process that models this, the switching noise is also a Pyrrhian Markovian process. Uh, and um, this is the, the sigma is, is the amplitude of, of the switching, and, and, and the, the epsilon, this epsilon, is the, um, is the frequency of the switch. Okay? So now, finally, our system writes like this. We have the same as before, but now we have a multiplicative term that depends on this on this fusion process, and uh, <clears throat> um, and the main the main the key the, the key note here is that we have two uh, in principle we have two sources of of, of stochasticity the the Poissonian noise, which is the intrinsic noise, is, is the natural noise of, of the system, and also this other, uh, which is also Poissonian uh, noise, which is extrinsic, okay? So it's the noise that is coming from, from the environment, essentially. Um, the, good, the, good, uh, the good news here is that, um, or it's, uh, it's natural to think like this, is that given a trajectory of, of this external noise, then this function is, is, is just a time-dependent uh, parameters. So you can, you can see, you can see this, um, this new this this new rate function as a, as a, as the as the old one, but now we we have a time dependent parameters because you can you can sample all the oscillators after you 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 sample one uh, trajectory of the um, extrinsic noise. Okay. Um, good. And if you have any question, please please interrupt or send a or send a message, uh, and then I I, I I will notice that everyone is is following. So, okay, good. So no questions? So far, so good. Okay, so in this work, we assume also that the, the extrinsic noise dominates the intrinsic one. So we assume that the number of particles of, the, of each oscillator is very large. So then we are close to a deterministic regime. So we are close to the, the ODE. Uh, and then the, the noise that is uh, dominating the, um, the trajectory is the, um, the extrinsic one, okay? Of course, in this work, we assume that uh, the amplitude of the noise for, for every reaction channel is the same. And um, if you, for this, for the, for the perturbed system, uh, when, when the number of particles goes to infinity, we, we have a piecewise deterministic Markovian process, which is this one. And in the fast switching regime, which means that epsilon goes to zero, we, we converge to the, to, the, um, to the reaction rate ODE, okay? Uh, this should be low, lower case C, okay? Um, so to sample this, uh, we will use essentially a Monte Carlo approach in order to, 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 to sample and check that the, um, 
that the that the synchronization of all systems is, is working. And there's just a, a brief note on, on, on the simulation algorithm. There is a classical simulation, stochastic simulation algorithm for, for, for the curse representation, which in principle does not apply for time dependent parameters, which is this case. But since uh, we choose uh, a extrinsic noise, which is piecewise constant, because it's, it's just it's a switching, and, and, and then the, the SSA algorithms is, is very easy to generalize and it still applies. Okay. In any case, the, since we are in a regime that the, the number of particles is very large, the, the computational time required for sampling one trajectory is, is very high. So we still don't use the SSA, but the, I mean the, the, but the philosophy of, the, of the, the classic simulation algorithms works. Um, for sampling this, this, um, this process, we use the tau leap approximation, which I will briefly mention later. Um, but uh, essentially, we, we, in, that, in that step, we introduce numerical noise, but numerical error, but we, 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 we are able to, means very, it's, it's, it's easy to control that error. Um, so the algorithms for sampling is, is pretty stable, even for, 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 for long times. Okay so, the, okay, so in this work, we are interested in, in, in stochastic, this, um, this stochastic system, uh, such that, the deterministic counterpart uh, support a limit cycle. Okay. Okay. So in order to compute the, um, in order to check that the system is synchronizing, we need to to compute the phase and and the, and the one uh, one class uh, one one very well known method, especially in this panel, for for computing the the phase is to to reduce um, is to use a phase reduction. So to here in the I'm, I'm talking about the, the deterministic case. So okay, so you, you know better than much better than me regarding this. But uh, yeah, the idea is that the limit cycle dynamics can be described by a uniformly rotating phase. Uh, and um, okay, I will denote the the, the periodic limit cycle by this phi, phi, phi of theta. Um, and uh, well, again. One one classic um, so so the, the, in the limit cycle we have a, a very a very straightforward way to to assign a phase to the to the system. But what happens when 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 you are in the basin, which is the case because we have we are we are in a stochastic setting, so we are we are essentially never in the in the limit cycle. So we are always in the in the basin, and and one idea is to is to compute the isochrons, which uh, um, was mentioned before in, in, in this in this in this track so I will not uh, spend too much time on that. Um, so okay so the idea is to find the asymptotically in the teacher trajectory. Uh, okay so I will okay so I will denote the, the isochronal phase map as with this big theta of for a point in the in the in the basin the, the, the phase is assigned to be alpha if um, for a trajectory that starts on the on the basin, if um, if meets, uh, I mean, we assign the phase of the of the limiting trajectory, of of the meeting limiting trajectory, okay. And uh, this is for the deterministic case and for the perturb um, uh, or, or stochastic oscillator near the limit cycle, we we use a, a, this this decomposition, which is essentially the limit cycle plus uh, a transversal per perturbation p. Which has this uh, this term here, which is uh, which uh, is inversely proportional to the square of, of, of n. So, um, <clears throat> so here in this work, we assume that n is is large enough such that the the, the stochastic tra trajectory is very close to the to the deterministic limit cycle. Okay, so this is uh, this is essentially a, a like a, like a linear noise approximation. And you here you are assuming uh, that the that the tra transverse uh, fluctuations are, are are Gaussians, okay? Um, which is a, a usual um, uh, analytic tool used in in when you have a because one of the main um, um, issues in the in the analytical point of view on, on these uh, pure jump systems is that you you don't have any more the, the classical stochastic calculus uh, tools because you, you have a discrete system is um, is not continuous so but uh, in order to compute approximations we always use the um, 
it's a, a, stock, a deterministic counterpart or the, the diffusion approximation, which I, 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 I did not discuss, but I, I showed some pictures. So, so you have in, in between the, the deterministic uh, approximation to the, to the pure champ system, in between you have the a diffusion approximation. And also in between the diffusion and the, and the, and the deterministic limit, you have the linear noise approximation. So, and these are, are the, the, the common tools in, in when you're working with pure jam processes. Okay, so, okay, this is just a, 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 a very ugly picture of what's going on. These are the, the, the approximate uh, isochrons, and this is what happens uh, close to the limit cycle. You have a trajectory. This is a pure jam process, but the, 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 the end is very large, so it, it, it's very reminiscent of a, of a uh, diffusion, of a, of a linear process. I mean, uh, an SD ito, ito diffusion. Okay. Okay. So in this work, we use uh, uh, an approach that, that is uh, developed by by Breslov and and and, and James, um, which is a variational principle, and is the way we compute uh, the projection of, of, of how we com we compute the um, the transversal per perturbations by 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 projecting the solution into the limit cycle by using a, a flo flo what is called floated vectors. And the resulting phase is equivalent to the isochronal phase, but uh, is um, but it has um, certain advantages to use this this uh, this um, variational approach, which is essentially the phase of the stochastic uh, process is is is, is the, the solution of this um, of this problem, uh, is, um, which is the difference between the the deterministic and the and the, and the between the limit cycle and and the and the the, the stochastic process uh, in a in a in a certain norm which is defined by the flow gate decomposition um, and and the, the good the good news from from this approach is that the the phase computation is accurate for very long times which is the, the case and also I'm I'm very important in, in this for the simulation for the for the for, for taking samples is that the, it's very efficient to compute the phase at, at any time. <clears throat> isochrons, if you want to use isochrons, it's possible to use it, um, but uh, it's very computational demanding because you need to pre-compute the isochrons and, um, and uh, well, at least a, a, a naive approach. And then uh, you have, it's also very, it's, I found that it's numerically very un unstable to try to, to compute the phase in this system by using the, the isochron approach. So this variational principle is, is, is much more robust. And also it has other, other analytical advantages that uh, allows you to accurately estimate the, the time that the system stays in close proximity to the limit cycle, which is, which is crucial for, for this work, uh, to, 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 be, to, be, to be sure that, the, um, that the, the stochastic trajectory stays close to the, to the limit cycle. Okay. So Patrick, uh, you know, you have three minutes left, two questions. Okay, yeah, okay. Okay, so how we compute the average level of synchronization? Um, in, this, in, in this work, we don't expect that there will be a, a, a complete synchronization because the, the intrinsic noise always work to the synchronized system. So the, 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 base, the base model is not deterministic. Uh, so, so you have a noise, internal noise that is always the, Desynchronizing the system, but of course, but we assume that n is large, so so the so the extrinsic noise dominates. Okay, so then under under certain um, technical condition and assuming that the probability and that the probability of the system stays close to the limit cycle is high, which is which is um, which is reasonable, but it's not totally obvious because remember that we still have the, the extrinsic noise and the amplitude, the sigma amplitude is 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 um is pushing the uh, really pushing the, the the stochastic trajectory out of the limit cycle the main result is that with with high probability this is the main result we are exploring that with high probability for long times the the average synchronization is is of this order it's approximately of this order it's inverse inversely proportional to the to the number of particles and then um the, the Inversely to the square of, of, of the frequency and the amplitude of the of the noise. Okay, so these are some results for the brucellator. Um, 
Of course, I mean, the, how we choose the parameters here is, is mainly by, by trial and error. We, 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 uh, we hope to have some, some, some more formal and, and way to, to choose the, the, the parameters for, for, a given, for a given model, in this case, the brucellator. And here you, you see that the, approximately the, the red is the, is the theoretical bound. For some, for some values are, are better than others. And, um, and this is for a fixed uh, sigma and for a varying epsilon. In this case, the, the estimated exponent is minus 1.5, it's not minus two. Um, here we have for a fixed epsilon and for a ch change in sigma. Um, and here for this example, the, the estimated exponent of sigma is, is, is is minus zero zero point two. Well, this is for this is another example. Um, so it's it's uh, for a system that is, has enzyme kinetics. It's not a mass action law, which, but still can be approximated by mass action law. But this we, we apply this this technique to, to to many to many examples actually with with, with mixed results. Um, in this case, it's also we also get somehow the the expected converge uh, i mean the, the convergence is to the expected values um in this case the the exponent for for epsilon is minus 1.7 which is pretty okay and the the estimated exponent for 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 sigma is minus 1 so what what, what we have observed is that the the exponents uh, depends uh, quite significantly from uh, on the model, on the particular model, you you, you are you are applying the, the, this this technique. Um, okay, these are some comments on 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 the path simulation, which is is, is pretty expensive to, to 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 sample these trajectories. And remember, you have two two sources of noise. Uh, although the, you have a um, small intrinsic noise, you have you have a significant extrinsic noise. So you need you are so essentially it's two two loops of simulations. You, you you can optimize that a little bit, but still the um, the interarrival times are very small. So you need very very small time steps in the in the tau leap approximations. Um, so the computations are, are pretty expensive. Even if even if they are trivially Par uh, parallelizable, still the, 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 they are expensive each, tra each trajectory because you need very uh, small time steps and very for very long times. Um, in the future, or, or actually, I, I already tried that uh, is to is to use other approximations instead of the tau leap approximation. This is a, this is a this is a, another approximation to the to the exact process is the tau leap, which I, I just briefly mentioned. It's, it's basically um, Approximate a Poisson process by Poisson random variables, uh, and but there are other approximations I mentioned: the Ito diffusion or linear noise approximation. So the, in these other approximations can can substantially reduce the computational time. And also, for, as a future work, um, which is as something we also observe, is that you can calibrate uh, the amplitude of, of of the extrinsic noise in such a way that you can you can also optimize how much noise you introduce in each channel. Here you, we introduce. Uh, the same noise for each reaction channel. So, but you can you can calibrate how much noise you can introduce, and you can you can get a. a I think you, we, you can control much uh, finer the the the, the com conversions of of the of the of the, of the simulation. Um, okay, and we we yeah, an, an efficient method to to estimate the the optimal frequency uh, for the external noise, and also we are exploring. Uh, Instead of a multiplicative noise, uh, we are exploring um, an additive noise, an additive external noise, which uh, we call common reaction channels, and uh, and the system looks like uh, looks like uh, a little bit more cumbersome, but uh, it's, it will be easier to to compute um, analytical results for for the, for the phase um, for the average phase, phase difference, uh, and that's it. That's that's that is pretty much what I, what I what I wanted to say. Thanks, Pedro. Uh, Peter has a question. Uh, it's just a little question about um, uh, back on slide eleven. So the way you're measuring synchronization, yes. um, you've got this alpha. These difference of these two alphas, um, yes. and the alphas are given by the the phase variable, 
right? Uh, theta of ci. Yeah. Yes. Is, isn't theta defined mod um, two pi or mod the period or mod one or something? So there would be jumps of a discrete jump every time you go around one oscillation. Yes. Yes. Uh, does it? Yes, yes. Does that mean you would have you have discrete jumps in your in your estimates? Um, I mean, does that add an artificial an artificial? Uh, does that does that make your synchronization look less synchronized, or do you somehow yes, this, this, take this that into a, account? This a, exactly. This is a whole issue. The, the plots you see here includes this, this, this like discrete and very large, if you want, compared to the. Yeah, we talk the, the phase difference. Yes, this is modulo the ring, though, right? So, so the phase difference is modulo modulo the ring. So it's the ring distance. So the the, the subtraction there is actually taking into account the. That's right. So yes, you have but, like, okay, that's what I that's what I was asking. Yeah. Yes, but you still you you still have. Uh, some somehow long longer longer phase difference when when you are going i think it's when you are when you're going back in the in, in the cycle yes i i am observing uh which is which seems spurious but but at the end is is the is the the jump that contribute to to have this 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 um this uh this conversions to the to the to what to the expected re results so yeah, okay, I, I'm, myself, I, I'm wondering if 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 this 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 jumps can be considered like old layers or something like that. And I, I, I was I was tempted to to observe what happens if you remove those. And but then you you will get a a, a much much less um, um, the synchronization level is is much uh, smaller than than the than the expected one. Um, yeah. This 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 these results includes this 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 somehow larger jumps. I am not sure if I answer your question, but uh, yeah, that, that that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pedro. I think we'll have an open discussion now. Um, so I'm going to try to find a way so that everyone can talk. If someone can help me, um, I don't know how to get the attendees to be able to talk. So you, you want me to... to uh, if you can share. transfer voice to me, Pedro, that'd be great. Yes, I will stop sharing and uh, make host games. Okay. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm going to... Arkady Pivkosti has a question. Hopefully you can talk now, Arkady. Yeah, so it's... Uh, sorry, I heard the question to Maximilian. Yeah. Well, okay, if you can answer. Yeah. Uh, so my question is so that you uh, assume existence of uh, attractive random limit cycle. Yeah. But it appears to me so to be extremely degenerate situation because typically you will have largest Lyapunov exponent non-zero, which means so either you have a point attractor or you have a fractal attractor. Mm -hmm. So is a, so you have to prepare a special system like a skew system you given yeah have the limit cycle so it is not generic case yeah i mean this depends on the kind of noise though right i mean yeah that's true this is a this is a particular situation and i think what you're describing is definitely true if you have purely additive noise um but if if something is directly yeah if there's if there's some um, typical multiplicative term as, as we looked at it there, and um, then you can, yeah, then you can connect it to these random limit cycles. I, I agree with you that it's um, it's not the not the situation you you are typically familiar with in these in these in these uh, limit cycles perturbed by noise. But uh, uh, yeah, we can, yeah, we can. It depends it on depends the noise. I'm just saying it really depends on the noise. That's true. But um, yeah, we can we can definitely try to provide um, a bigger class of examples, and this is this is kind of a little problem. Though, as uh, was already pointed out as well, I think there are definitely aspects of that that can be transferred also to the non-random limit cycle case. So we can dif different ideas here can can definitely also in a similar way as discussed for the isostables. I think can also be transferred to that. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, 
th thank you for answering, but I still think so. It is extremely degenerate. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends definitely on this noise. But yeah, I will, I, I will try to convince you that there are more cases. But yeah, I agree with like many examples of noise that we know. This will be a little bit difficult. That's, that's definitely true. It's yeah. not difficult. So it is just you calculate largest Lyapunov exponent. It is generically non-zero. That's it. It's not difficult. Okay, but we can discuss yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, fine. Especially enough. when you will be in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, then we can <laughs> have a closer look. Uh, yeah, for additive noise, it's definitely not happening. Um, and we have to understand for what kind of noises. For this multiplicative noise, it's definitely true. Um, and it's not matter of it is additive or multiplicative. You just have a skew system where the phase comes in another equation. Yes. And this is a degenerate situation. Okay, fair enough, yeah. I had a question for Maximilian as well, this is James. Um, I, I maybe don't understand your slides, but should, shouldn't, I mean, all basically if it's a globally attracting limit cycle, shouldn't every noise realization lead to the same isochronal phase? Because in general, they're always gonna synchronize eventually, no matter where they start, right? I'm yeah, but... No, I mean, it really depends. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, you have to imagine that there's something where for each omega, it is like a deterministic, um, it is like a deterministic problem. Um, so no, you still have this, for this kind of situation, you still have this foliation into these different isochrons at the, at the random limit cycle. And there will not be for a particular omega, there will not be the synchronization of all these, all these different starting I understand that you're right. So, like for an arbitrary omega, that's true. But I think if omega is, is like Brownian motion, like white noise, yeah, I think that like with probability one, the phases should always synchronize no matter what the starting position. So, I mean, I think Pikovsky's got papers on this, right? Yeah, yeah, but this is um, this is true for for yeah, probably many generic systems. This this is true, but for this. Um, for this particular situation, if you have this random limit cycle, then definitely for a particular omega, um, you have this you have this proper foliation. So you don't have with probability one uh, the same isophases everywhere. I think this is this is definitely definitely different here. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think I think any noise that I mean I think I'm trying to think of the counter examples. I think any sort of martingale noise, so any sort of stochastic integral that's driving it, I think that would lead to synchronization, I think, if it's a globally attracting limit cycle. Um, but yeah, I guess there's probably counterexamples, other, other types of noise that wouldn't do that. Yeah, um, I, I think I, I, I see what you mean. Um, this is, this is, yeah, this was exactly this, this, this typical case of synchronization by a particular driving signal this is a very this is a very typical phenomenon that's true, and in that sense, this situation is definitely very very special, and that's 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 true from the physical point of view. But still, really, if you can construct it in this random dynamical system sense, this kind of random limit cycle, and then you will not have this particular synchronization. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I think this is really referring also to to what Arkady Pikovsky just said that this is a this is a situation which differs from the typical generic situations that that you will look at very often um so maybe this is confusing in that sense but um yeah in this in this context you really you really get these different different isophases thank you yeah. <clears throat> i've got a question this is peter um uh, if, if you still had your slides up, I would ask you to go back to slide five, <laughs> but maybe that's not possible. Um, but you, my question is about this, the structure of the, um, of this random limit cycle. So I think that's where you introduced um, A of omega, so this, the, the pullback, uh, and, and you had a, a diagram or a figure with a sort of a tangle of trajectories in a big, in a big ball of yarn. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to, so I think I understand that the random limit cycle is a different when you have a different for each different sample point omega. Is, yeah. is A of omega, does it form a closed loop? Just a different random closed loop for each omega 
or or does it not form a closed loop? It just sort of forms a a particular spirally tangle of of a trajectory. No, that it, all it, the initial conditions converge to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah, in in this particular case, it really forms this closed loop. Um, and and the omega really determines only where it lies. So the structure is always the same, but uh, the omega realization really um, really determines where this limit, uh, where this where this where this object lies in the state space. And it will actually be so the the, the position or like the, the 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 position of the of the centers of these limit cycles they will be distributed according to. Uh, the, the ergodic or stationary distribution. So this will be distributed, these, these cycles will be, will be distributed all over the state space according to the ergodic or stationary distribution. And of course, you would be usually interested in mainly these parts where most of the mass lies, and that's close to the original deterministic limit cycle. So omega-wise, we have these really closed loops, which are, yeah, which are then in a, in, a, in a small neighborhood of this original deterministic one, because most of the mass of the stationary distribution will lie there if I have a strong enough drift there. Um, and, and this is what differs omega-wise, this kind of position. Okay, so, so the picture is that you have, you sort of, you go from a uh, closed loop deterministic limit cycle to a, uh, a loop that's been all bent out of shape, but it's still a loop. Yes. And the way that the way that it's been perturbed is a function of the the entire yes. noise sample. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Yeah. Are there more questions? I have questions, but I think I'll email them privately. I need to think about it. <laughs> Are there public questions? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe let me just mention to apologize already. I think I I, I showed you, like I, I let you know that tomorrow I can I cannot uh, participate. Right. I, couldn't give the twenty yeah. fifth as a possible date, so unfortunately, I can not participate. But this is all recorded, is that right? So one can watch it later on. It should be, yeah. I hope if I don't stuff something up, it should be recorded. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's fine. Okay. Well, uh, we've had a really good crowd, um, and I appreciate everybody making time to come and uh, participate. So shall we shall we call it quits at this point uh, until tomorrow? Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Peter, and every other speaker. Thank you. It was really great. Thanks, James, for doing all the heavy lifting. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Pleasure. Yeah, so ten o'clock tomorrow morning. If more, more, more of the same. Great. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop it now. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. Sarah.